welcome to the fitness podcast. Um, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Since Skype is just telling me that I got to inform you that I'm recording you, Mustafa. Oh, okay, you're recording me? Okay. You're recording muscles and this brain over here. <laughs> but, yo, uh, today we're going to be talking about um, mental illness and the legal in combat sports and the legality of it. Yeah. Um, Basically, I just want to give a brief introduction before we go into the le- legal side of everything uh, of combat sports. I know there's a lot of negative stigma, and I talked about it a lot in previous episodes, especially with my podcast with uh, Keon, Carl, and so on. Any exercise is amazing for you. You get a lot of endorphins. You got to get a lot of uh, mental stability and so on that you wouldn't get from not exercising. It helps you both physically and mentally. Um, But, like, it reduces depression and anxiety. It gives you a spectral intelligence that sitting down and reading a book wouldn't give you. And it's a really big benefit to have. But there are always going to be consequences. You cannot ask you cannot be a power lifter without getting a cramp. You can't be a swimmer without almost drowning once in a while. Yeah. Same thing in combat sports. Yes, you're going to get injured. But what we're talking about today is going to be the long-term effects of getting constant impact to the head without taking proper procedures to take care of yourself. Um, stuff like CTE, early onset Alzheimer's, um, Parkinson's. The biggest example I want to bring for that was um, Muhammad Ali. In his last fight, I think it was with Holmes, um, Ali was so much in debt that by this point, like Ali has like been discovered to have Parkinson's for two years. And his... He just... He couldn't like touch his nose and punch at the same time. From the reports, he couldn't speak a full sentence without slurring his words, yet he still took the fight because he was that much in debt. And it's estimated that he took around 200,000 blows to the head in the ring, not including the blows he took during training and sparring. So as much as a legend this guy was, uh, the amount of ill care he took for his own mental health at that time in terms of taking impact to the head, was really his downfall. And if you were to see later Ali, it really makes you sad because at the age Arnold is right now, Muhammad Ali was, I'd say, like, he was a same level of athlete in terms of, like, physical prowess in his prime. Mm-hmm. But by the end, like, when, when Muhammad Ali got to the same age uh, my man Arnold is right now, You can really see, like, he became really old, really skinny. He couldn't control anything. And it was just really sad for me. So I just want to, like, have a discussion about that. And also, like, bring into insight what CTE is. So CTE is basically, like, the chronic traumatic... uh, and celopathy, or CTE for short, which a lot of people who, it, which is a degenerative brain disorder, which many people actually get. I'll be putting the link for this in my description, but essentially you can get it when you're really young. Anyone who has multiple concussions or multiple uh, traumas to the head, where uh, your, your brain starts forming, a, a protein called tau starts forming in your brain that uh, slowly degenerates your brain cells. It kills the brain cells. So if you look at someone who has CTE, the amount of brain cells in their brain deteriorates a lot quicker. And it can happen in their early 20s and 30s. Uh, like that, Muhammad was, uh, Muhammad Ali was in his er- like what early, late 20s, mm-hmm. early 30s when this started kicking in yeah. for him as well. Yeah. And 
a lot of the symptoms are control, impulse control, aggression, a lot of depression and paranoia, which, mind you, these are what a lot of the emotions that cause criminal action, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, not being able to control such uh, emotions. No. But with someone who has CT, their brain is shrinking and they can't actually get a grip on this. Yeah. So that's why uh, I wanted to get uh, you on here to basically talk about uh, CT itself. The, uh, or like the, or the legality side. The legality of behind it. Okay. Yeah. So um, how would like just just giving a brief introduction of mental health overall in the yes. judicial system uh, and how is it treated? Okay. So in the legal system, again, this is purely a legal uh, definition. I know most of you are familiar with the legal term insanity, uh, which is used in the United States. I'm not familiar with the legal system of the state. However, I'm very familiar with the legal system of uh, Canada itself because I'm a uh, paralegal student. Also, forgot to introduce myself. My name is Mustafa. Hi, guys. Um, I've been a pro wrestling promoter, everything, but I'm also a paralegal student. So, and a legal student as well. So, and he's also a, a professional Bob's and Virgin uh, picture. <laughs> All right. No. It's an inside joke between us. Uh, right. Sorry about that. Guys. We'll, make, we'll end up making a meme, but it's already a gigantic meme. But back to mental disorder, that is what you said, CTE, right? Now, here's the problem CTE comes under an umbrella of mental disorder. So, mental disorder is basically defined in the simplest of terms, the disease of the mind, according to the Canadian legal system. Now, the disease of the mind is used as a common defense when it comes to um, criminal trial status. Now, it says here in section 16 of the criminal code, I'll, I'll read it out to you. No person is criminally responsible for an act committed or an omission made while suffering from a mental disorder that rendered the person incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of the act or omission or of knowing that it was wrong. The presumption in the legal system that is when you're accused of a uh, criminal charge is, and I quote, every person is presumed not to suffer from a mental disorder so as to be exempt from criminal responsibility by virtue of subsection one. This is subsection two. Until the contrary is proved on the balance of probabilities. Now the burden of proof uh, in section three says, the burden of proof that an accused is suffering from a mental disorder so as to be exempt from criminal responsibility is on the party that raises the issue. Now, three things that we're establishing here. So we're establishing that this is a disease of the mind that rendered you incapable to determine that what you were doing as a crime was right or wrong. The second thing that you have to determine is that the burden of, um, what do you call it? It's the assumption that when you're charged for criminal charges, right? Whatever you did, it is presumed that you do not suffer from a mental disability or disorder, that is. Again, that is the presumption by courts. Now, if you wish to bring that defense that you have a mental disorder or mental illness as, you know, the reason you committed the crime. Now, you have to determine if the burden, usually the burden to prove that you committed a crime is on, in Canada's case, the crown. In most countries, it's the, the, the government, the state. The state has to prove that you were the one, beyond reasonable doubt, committed a crime. However, if you bring up the defense of mental illness, then it is on you, the accused, who has to prove that they are, were mentally incapable. Now, with that all being said, what, um, what does that mean? Based, or what is the further step basically okay so once you've proven that you know you're mentally incapable there's this misconception that um you know you'll have a 
uh, you'll get scot free automatically. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There's even like there's even steps to approach it. There's a case called the Crown v. Stone, which actually determined the steps. Now, the judge, it will be up to the judge, and I'm simplifying this. It'll up to be the judge to determine um, what system do you end up going to. That is, um, sometimes like you get a completely different trial because you prove that you have a mental illness. So you'll have a completely different trial. Sometimes like your charges will be reduced, but if sometimes even in some cases, your sentence might even increase. So it is sometimes not even advisable to use the quote unquote defense of mental illness. So it is a very gray area that is in the legal system because there's no clear cut definition as to what direction it will go once it's proven that you suffer from a specific mental disorder, because it will also depend on the kind of mental disorder that you're suffering from that is. So like, you know, there's psychosis, there's bipolar, there's, um, you know, like you said, there's trauma, the result of trauma to the head, basically. There's, there's so many different variations of mental illnesses that it will depend on not only the judge and at times even the jury as well will have to determine like what direction this is going to go, what the sentence will be, what, uh, you know, should be be acquitted of all charges, should be be released on parole. It will depend on the, the workings of the legal agents, that is, to determine what the best outcome is, because this can only be established on a case by case basis, that is. I've tried to simplify it my as best as I can with the limited knowledge that I have. Um, uh, do you have any questions, uh, Nick? Uh, so far, um, I just want to ask, like, is it, how would the procedure of actually proving something like this happen? Would Because I know doctors have to do a lot of tests, like, Yes. Uh, in terms of uh, like discovering certain because CT is extremely difficult to actually detect. Yes. Because of its so like so many of its symptoms, like you don't know which one yeah. is there, you don't know all that. So it, it might take a while. So would the crown actually pay for um, the medical costs of actually getting this tested, or would it be? Up to the person to, up to the, lose. Uh, in in this case, because the burden is on the person, right? So the crown's not going to cover, cover your costs because they're there to prove that you know you committed the crime. But they're there to determine whether you committed the crime or not. It can be even like you can talk to your legal representative as to how to approach this, right? Or if you can request something. So there are different systems for. Uh, different uh, report status so it, it really depends honestly like there's no clear cut answer for it but advisable if you're in a situation like that where you do have a mental disorder uh, talk to your not only your medical professional also your legal representative as well given that time that is um, that's the best I can say for the time being because it's not very clear cut yeah um do you, like, I know this is a bit of an addition, but, like, to your knowledge, do you know of any development in l laws that actually help with identifying certain mental illnesses? Because I know um, mm -hmm. for a lot of places, if you unless you go to a doctor and try to get it checked out, mm -hmm. you're not going to... Like no one's gonna help you, but where but certain mental illnesses uh, can be extremely harmful, but can be hard to detect for the individual. Absolutely, this is why the um, quote unquote uh, it's it's where the the because it it lies. That's why it's it's uh, the burden of the proving that you're mentally disabled in law, uh, in the court, that is, lies on the accused. And usually um, at that point, you're, if the accused doesn't bring that up, that is, even if he does have a mental disorder and doesn't bring that up, sorry, but 
the court's not going to help you out basically on that one because that burden will all be on the legal representative aka your defense counsel now the court can appoint a defense counsel for you that is. they're going to have to actually appoint a defense counsel for you or they because they will give you the opportunity to go through the procedure because we do want to guarantee that you get procedural fairness that is. at least yeah. that's the right that's your right as a citizen that um, you know you get all the proper procedure before we even convict you and sometimes the tr- like you know because we think that oh we'll go immediately to trial sometimes reports will take time right yeah. so you can um like with your legal representative in a hearing that is you can say something like you know we would request to um you know adjourn or delay the hearing to a specific date because we're obtaining reports on a specific time so the judge can actually grant you um it depends on the judge that is he may be able to grant you um an adjournment to till the specified date that you requested um that is and you know you could, you could in the meantime obtain a uh, uh, a medical report that suggests like the symptoms that you were suffering from like whether you have like um you know anxiety attacks something like with dreams um hallucinations anything with uh mental disorder and also the the mental disorder should be such that it has to prevent you from determining right and wrong sometimes mental disorders are not enough um sometimes even during a mental disorder you know the difference between right and wrong that is so the defense only works if to the point where you don't know that what you're doing is right or wrong that is so if anything like it this is where it gets very because mental illnesses the very like it's just have a very recent development right so you know and the new things that we knew about know about concussions and brain trauma and what not and that's where you know we were trying to do more research in this field um to and this is for now i'm giving you the best of my knowledge i'm not a legal expert at this point so um you if you guys have a suggestion as well like something that you've learned just put it in the comments below and you know we we can actually take a look at it as well um and add to that um so yeah that's uh that's the that's the best i could answer with i went on a bit of a like i went all in circles i apologize because there's just oh. something specific about it yeah um i also want to ask about like in like bring it to my area of specialty combat sports mm-hmm. um some studies actually i'm actually looking at them right now they'll put it i'll put it in the description in the description below um so cte is found primarily in the exposed impacts to the head so there's 200 plus confirmed uh cases in the va bu and clf brain banks mm-hmm. um so boxing there's 50 plus uh global cases but and when i say discovered i'm not talking about the people that are alive ct is technically met, uh, medically impossible to detect mm-hmm. until the person is dead mm-hmm. because it is so broad you have to look at the brain itself physically to see the loss of brain cells mm-hmm. but you can see the side effects as the person is living with mm-hmm. its symptoms like um mood swings um your like me- your moods change you're constantly getting headaches you can't memorize things properly anymore um but boxers do have some of the highest cases out there same thing with like UFC and even I think professional one. wrestlers too pro wrestlers yeah. too, because there's a lot of impact to the head if yeah. you see chair shots mainly to the head that's the most common in professional wrestling so like that's a big trauma on the head as well um 
And yeah, I, uh, once you finish, I'll actually bring up a pro wrestling case. But yeah, I'm sorry I cut you off, basically. Oh, no worries. I just want to uh, mention it, like, bring, er, basically ask, how would, how would you bring uh, light into this, or like, bring in uh, help for combat sports to regulate the mental health of its fighters? Because... Mm-hmm. Because I know a lot of people like that Ali fight. He should have been nowhere near the ring in that mm-hmm. last fight against Holmes. But he needed the money. Yet, So he went in knowing full well that he couldn't put his arm out straight. No. Stop holding his nose. He couldn't speak no. a full sentence. So no. what kind of regulations do you think uh, you would put on a uh, combat sport My to big- help with this? Oh, yeah. My biggest one regulation I would establish is an athletic commission for combat sports specifically that is that will regulate certain rules for promoters the second thing i would establish is um, i would encourage unionization of fighters that is whether you're in a combat like in ufc whether you are in uh, a professional wrestler whether you're any sport that has trauma to the head or combat sport um should have a big uh, a union representative that is to in order to you know because what the misconception is that um about union unionization is that um you know the they take away from profits they're just always striking all the time no that's not necessarily the case uh unions kind of guarantee that workers receive the benefits um the health benefits as well as like the enough salary to cover expenditure status so they can negotiate on your behalf, that is. Or, and these are workers coming in together collectively, that is. Hello. So if anything, um, like with uh, union, it, I would encourage unionization of uh, fighters and professional wrestlers. That way they can, a lot of them are either, like there's your fighters that are getting paid like millions of dollars in their contract. And then you have, fighters are barely getting paid for fight, right? So yeah. <clears throat> that's the <clears throat> sorry, unfortunate reality of the situation because the lack of because of the lack of regulation. I am more aware of this in the professional wrestling field that you only have one giant body, which is the WWE, has a monopoly, and then you have tiny, smaller independent promotions that don't have enough money to you know, well or even uh, or just don't spend enough money on their talent status. And the talent is putting itself at risk most of the time. Um, what, and that's my recommendation, uh, the most effective. Again, keep in mind, this is also my opinion, and the most effective way to prevent, you know, any, like, because in this situation, like the union will guarantee that, hey, you will be able to, like, get some insurance benefits based on, you know, like, you you received some, you cannot fight. Like, it'll determine. And, you know, it also the, the fighter also I would encourage to be responsible for their health, too. Um, and a lot of fighters or wrestlers that is, have talked to me and suggested that, um before you get into this, we we don't have a union. We don't have any protection. So it's best that, you know, you get an education before you join this field, right? Like something to back it up, basically. So again, both looking at both ways, so from the business perspective, as well as the individual perspective. So all these have something to back up, basically. Um, uh, what do you call it? But yeah, which which bothered me, what bothers me is that there's the lack of uh, regulation, at least with professional wrestling, because it's called sports entertainment. Now, that's why Vince McMahon was able to not pay taxes to the, um, what do you call it? He, he wasn't, everything okay? Sorry, yeah. I, parents call, you know, yeah, 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 no, I hear you. Uh, but yeah, like there's the lack of um, regulation. I think it's just that you have to regulate it a bit more and you have to, um, what do you call it? 
unionization of uh, worker status. That's my best suggestion, basically. Uh, I totally agree with you. Like, the thing is, with the corruption that goes on with the commissions currently, I think definitely having a union for the fighters is a mm -hmm. lot better. Because, biggest yeah. example, uh, did you ever hear about what happened with the Nevada State Com Athletic Commission and boxing? Well, what happened? What happened with that? A lot of corruption took place. Uh, mm -hmm. They absolutely ruined it. And mm -hmm. the thing is, the actual the commissioner actually took, like, actually agreed to all the corruption that he took. I'll be putting a link to that as well, mm. to that blog post. But yeah, yeah. he was um fined. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you heard of um, Don King, the famous promoter? That is. Yeah, I did. Yeah, Don King was the one who even took advantage of Ali and not paying him enough. So Don King was a factor. Um, I think it was either Tyson or one of the fighters described him as a reptilian capitalist, that is. So yeah. um, I think, yeah, he, he has a huge bad record of like corruption as well. Like he was the one who practically financially corrupted boxing as an industry. Um, Right now, that's, this reminds me, like, I really wanted to talk about the Benoit case. We cannot talk about CTE without talking about Chris Benoit, the double murder suicide that is. Yeah. Now, Chris Benoit, like, when they discovered his brain after the incident, he, there, were, there was, like, CTE. His brain was equivalent to that of a 70-year-old Alzheimer's patient. Yeah. That was his equivalent of the brain. So imagine like the head trauma, the damage that he actually went through. And if you look at his matches, they were brutal, basically. Combine that with depression from losing his best friend, Eddie Guerrero. Combine that with steroid abuse. Combine that with, um, you know, alcohol. Um, and, you know, also there was basically toxic locker room culture. And you have a recipe for disaster. And this was what happened. Like, it, there was a, a several untreated concussions, several, like, there was plenty of brain trauma. I'm not justifying what he did, basically. Again, we're just saying what caused him to explode, finally. And not only that, yeah. he strangulated his own son, he strangulated his wife, and then he strangulated himself by hanging. And... Um, what this this was this was what led to also the downfall of professional wrestling that is sure there were more um precautions taken um more precautions but how effective are they like because wwe has a wellness policy but i feel that because they're a private entity they can make exceptions for certain people that is like they, they, they can decide to make exceptions for certain people and then they're more, more flexible. Um, and the rules are not very efficiently enforced. If it were a government regulation, yeah, the rules would be efficiently more enforced, quote unquote. Um, uh, someone did propose, like in the Canadian Independent Wrestling, that you know we should let the, the Ontario Athletic Commission uh, take over. But another better suggestion, like I just stated before, we should unionize the wrestlers. And let's extend it to the fighters as well. Um, and also, like, we need to recognize that, you know, how much, like, we need to be very careful of the fighters, that is, we, because this is something that is uh, for the safety. Um, I know in professional wrestling, we have banned head chair shots in order to prevent further cases. There used to be something called lighting, that is to get the blood out, basically. It's very rare now. It's like one or two matches a year, basically, at this point. And we have also seen this backlash from audience members, too, audience members and fans saying, oh, we want more blood. We want, like, you know, uh, bigger moves and, like, dangerous moves. Why? Like... 
if it weren't for people like this, then this thing, all of this thing would have been prevented altogether, right? Like people clamoring. Like there's also like, we also need to, as audience members of fighting, we also need to build some empathy on our part too. We have to also do our part as well as recognize. And we also have to support our fighters too, that, you know, they, we should ha- advocate for better their better health. We shouldn't like, you know, give them a reason to be depressed and we shouldn't give them a reason to, you know, contribute to their mental disorder as well. We should show them respect as well. Um, instead of, um, what do you call it? Basically, um, I think there's like that toxic insults that people generally throw at combat sport fighters, basically, generally. So we need to be a bit, you know, like I'm not saying like don't criticize their fights. You know, you can absolutely criticize their technique and whatnot, for sure. But just don't go to the point of, you know, uh, throwing insults behind the computer screen. Because even then, words can have an effect as well. So there's also this, sorry, went on this tangent as well. No so yeah. toxic fan bases also kind of con- contribute to the lack of regulation that is. And, you know, we need to we need to regulate a lot of things. And sure, fights will seem very sanitized, but it's for the best, that is. Because even a sanitized fight or a sanitized professional wrestling will still take a lot out of you. But just enough that, you know, it's um, like the fighter can have a long career, that is. You want to ensure fighters have a long career rather than a short one, that is. Yeah. So uh, what's your opinion on uh, Andrew Martin then, as well? Andrew He's also a, yeah, also a WWE wrestler. Um Second guy in wrestling that we found with CTE, and in 2009, he was actually uh, yes, test. Yes, he was an unfortunate, like, he he died too. He died, yeah, he he died uh, of oxycodone uh, overdose. Yes, yes, no, it's uh, no, I, I don't know much about test, but like. His what surprises me is that his death was just brushed under the rug. That is not a lot of people talk about his death. Like, yeah, like and this I'm was sorry, I think it was because, because of the fact that this was post Benoit, like after two just two years after Benoit double murder suicide. So WWE tried their best, and they tried their best to distance themselves from you know, any causes of murder, even though they should also be held just as responsible for causes of, uh, you know, murder, that is. And I think, actually, let me just take a look, very quick look, that is. And uh, I didn't know, yeah, the storyline. And he was 34 years old only. 34, that is young. Yeah, it's absolutely uh, shitty. Like even he, he, even he has CTE, basically, just like Chris Benoit. And these were repeated concussions. He was from that era where you know you had the chair shots, the really heavy, you know, the heavy moves. That is, sure, we've kind of reduced that, and people say, oh, it's because we don't have heavy moves that wrestling is not popular. No, it's, that's not the reason at all. I can find anything that's a good thing that we're doing to wrestling. Um, that is all I know the whole other topic as to why professional wrestling isn't as popular as it was before, but that's a whole different issue altogether. Right now we're even, um, I know in dark side of the ring, Chavo Guerrero even stated that he doesn't know how much CT, if he even has CT, he potentially he does because he's also from that era of, yeah violent, very violent wrestling, that is. And, um, you know, and this was, I think the attitude there, over, even the Rock, Stone Cold have taken head shots to the head, basically. So, you know, there's, there's a, like, we don't know at this point, like, we don't know which wrestler is suffering from CTE, that is. And, and it's the unfortunate c- scenario that we're faced with. And, like, I wish I had the answers, but unfortunately I don't, as to how we can resolve the issue 
like clear cut. That is because even the advocating for a union, there will be some disadvantages. That is because now less people will break into wrestling. There will be more less opportunities for someone to become a wrestler. It may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing, but it depends. It just depends. Yeah, that's one major thing that really does piss me off that what like they don't really blame themselves for the actions that did happen because back in, mm-hmm. because I do agree like mental illness and like education about mental health only was popular in like the last 10 years or so last decade yes yeah but like all before that like the atrocities that did happen in combat sports mm-hmm really makes me sad like the biggest thing that i'm shocked about was george foreman and how he didn't get it yeah but this guy basically was the real life version of rocky where like he did an amazing job of blocking punches with his face Mm -hmm. but like it's a really strange thing where i don't know whether or i don't you one cannot tell how an athlete gets it and just having certain mental health issues, such athletic commissions did not do a proper job of mm-hmm. monitoring their yeah. athletes' mental health. That's yeah. actually one thing I recommend for yes. the commission. Every yes. fight, check your athlete, give him a mental test. Mm-hmm. If ap- before the next fight his mental health is deteriorated, he is not allowed to fight anymore. He has to take a mandatory retirement from the yeah. combat sport. Yeah. Not only is it mandatory retirement, like it'll depend on the case. I would say yeah. break, basically. Take a break. You um, take a break, take some psychiatric help, yeah. which the commission has to pay for because he's losing mental health. Like yeah. he's losing and, brain cells for and, you. And there should be like an, like, you know, benefit that is an insurance benefits, com- like, you know, uh, tribunal that should also determine like they, they, they qualify for benefits that is. Yeah, like you have people like Ray Borg and Mm -hmm. the case of Ray Borg is really sad because he is a broke fighter, but his son needed uh, surgery and Ray Borg was just taking fights to pay for his son's surgery and what if he got CT because of taking one of those fights because you're putting in a tough position where he has to choose between feeding his child or getting mental health issues and until... I trash Brandon Scobb a lot mm. about his MMA skills, but like the guy has a heart of gold. The guy paid for Ray Borg's med- son's medical bills. Yes. yes. But it, yeah. like the fact that the commission did absolutely nothing, knowing the consequences mm. of a combat sport like that, mm-hmm. really pisses me off. Yeah. Which is why I advocate for like not only stronger regulations, but. Like I at this point, because like the the corruption is so high, like unionization is one thing that could significantly reduce this problem. That is, that is at least guarantee that the the, the wrestlers, the fighters, the boxers at least get their share of you know like being able to pay for their any of the medical benefits that their their family members have, and especially. In the United States, it is very necessary in the United States um, to have um, what do you call it? Because like the lack of healthcare, we we definitely need you know uh, what do you call it? The unionization, and that way we can guarantee like health benefits. And you know, mainly our our this is health health of the family as well, like of the fighter that is because they are providing for their family. Yeah, and it's this is something really close to my heart as a topic because I totally understand what the fighters feel, that mm-hmm. urge to do something that they love. The fact that mm-hmm. they fight means that it's like it's something that they really do love, but the commission or the entity that's supposed to be looking out for them is doing an absolute horrible job of doing yeah. it. And it's uh, like they really have to step up their game on that. Oh yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, like that's. I think we've we've kind of stated that. Yeah, we've. Like I hope we hammered home the point basically um, of 
uh, what do you call it, how we solve the problem, legally speaking at least, that is. Because unless there's a legal system that has implemented, um, you're not going to be able to protect your fighters and or potential victims should the fighter be able to end up committing a crime due to mental disorder, that is. So also you want crime prevention. You also want incident prevention. You also want prevention of the disease of the mind. So do you want to take guarantee that it's a, we have a safe society? That is, you want to guarantee a safe society. Instead of distancing yourself from the incident, like, yeah, I guess it's bad for PR, but you have to take responsibility for, you know, like, I've... There was a case of Jimmy Snuka. Um, I know he did also may have suffered from head trauma, but because he supposedly killed his girlfriend, again, he was charged with killing murder of his girlfriend. The trial never took place. It took place 30 years later, but he was incapable of attending trial because of his you know, injuries. And then he died. So, and... Like what you've basically done is that, you know, you've created a dangerous situation. If you don't take care of the mental health of your fighters, you've created a horrible situation for, you know, not only your fighters, but also their loved ones as well. Yeah. And on that note, like, I think we did cover everything. Yeah. That I want to talk about. So, mm -hmm. um, do you have any other I'll questions? Put links to uh, so far, that's all I wanted to cover, but it is oh. the last topic, so I wanted to leave it open for now to have a discussion in the in the comments. Yes, uh, in the comments, uh, yeah. I will be responding to them, and I will also put the links that I have found and Mustafa has found in the description. Mm, um, also, wanted to bring up the company that my friend Christian started. I made mm -hmm. a video on this today and uploaded it. Okay. Where he has a uh, computer building website now, uh, mm -hmm. where you can buy parts and so on. Uh, yes. I'm not going to have any monetization, monetary uh, gain from recommending his site, but it is, is a very good idea. Yeah. Fair prices, helps you with a build, really clear and concise. And he is my friend, so I wanted to help him out by publicizing his work. His link will be in yeah. my description as well. And also... Today's UFC 249, so I just want to get your opinion on a few of the uh, matchups. I'm going to show you the stats, and I just want to mm -hmm. get your opinion. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can screen share. Um, can you see my screen? No, I cannot see it yet. Dude, screw Skype, all right? Uh, one second. <laughs> I like Zoom better. <laughs> all right. Uh, this is going to be part one of this chat. We're going to go back onto the, our favorite Zoom, and then we're going to do a, a quick analysis of okay. the stats. Uh Hey guys, so uh, welcome back. Sorry, we wanted to go back to our old friend Zoom. Um, yeah, let me just pull up the UFC matchup. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to be watching the live stream on this. Uh, I couldn't get care less for the lower cards, but mm -hmm. the title fights I think are really good matchups. Uh, let me just share my screen. And Sumit's going to come on as well soon. Apparently, he went for a bath. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have Ferguson. Ferguson and Gaethje. Justin Gaethje. Okay. So we have Ferguson. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down, slow down. Okay. So 26 to 3, 21 to 2. Okay, very similar. Um, five foot eleven, five foot eleven, same weight. Um, Ferguson definitely has the advantage when it comes to the reach. That is, 
um, also with leg reach and arm reach, basically. Yeah. Uh, oh, yo, Mustafa, Sumit's online. Say hey. Oh, hi, Sumit. Yo, Sumit, say hi to our. Uh... Yo, Sumit, say hey. Yeah, hi, 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 hi. Sorry, guys, I'm late. Oh, no worries. Uh, we just covered quite a bit, but we're also going to be talking about the UFC 249 fight. So I know you wanted to hear as a live audience. So we just started this part. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, yeah, Mustafa, let's go back. Uh, Tony Ferguson is a gorilla. A six and a half inch uh, advantage in reach. Yes, um, my money. It even though as unpredictable as it is, uh, my money is definitely on Tony Ferguson. Yeah. Um, because of on the basis of experience, like slightly slight advantage in terms of experience. Like I would say, compared to twenty nine fights to twenty three fights in total. Um, yeah. Like and the reach as well as the leg reach. And let's see the win by uh, stats, that is. And there's another section on the bottom. Another of section. Okay, so Ferguson has won by KO or TKO 50% of the times. Justin Gaethje, 86% of the time. Submission, 31% by Ferguson, 5% by Gaethje. Uh, decision, 19% Ferguson and 10% Gaethje. So in terms of decision, and also look at average fight time. 10 minutes and 4 seconds, 8 minutes, ooh, 39 seconds. Knockout average, okay. So. And I'll just show you the next section as well so you can. And significant strike. And grappling. Okay. So landed per minute. Okay. Um, 44%, 54%. Absorb per minute, ooh, okay. And defense, 63, 53. Go down. Grappling is, hmm, this is, this got very interesting, actually. Actually, go back up, go back up, go back up, 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 before significant strikes. So we'll analyze this section by win by, right? Just yeah. to, uh, like, you know, look at and see. So Ferguson is less likely to win by TK or KO. If Kichi wins, he's very likely to win by KO or TKO. Yeah. Now, in terms of submission, Ferguson has the advantage. 31% of his fights he's won via submission. Um, 90, even by decision, he has an advantage. But in terms of KO, Gichi has the advantage. Um, the average fight time is basically Ferguson having 10 minutes and 4 seconds, Gichi having 8 minutes and 39 seconds. Which kind of goes to show that Ferguson has a higher, um, you know, I would say in terms of fight stamina, that is slightly higher fight stamina on average that is based just alone on stats. Um, so, so far, it's my money's still going on Ferguson. Now, knockout, knockdown average. Is this, um, so per 15 minutes, knockdown average, like what is this stat supposed to tell us? So basically every 15 minutes, how many... Uh times did he knock over his opponent like do you know how you punch someone right. they fall down and like they have right. to like stand up to recover yeah. so justin gichi has definitely an advantage in that basically because yeah. he's not his opponents down more that is so again gichi has the advantage in that aspect now let's go down and let's analyze the uh significant strikes um, oh and uh, something that's going to surprise you is gichi is mm -hmm. a uh, wrestler Professional wrestler or amateur? Amateur wrestler, Greco-Roman. Okay, so he's a Greco-Roman wrestler. Okay. And so, that's going to shock you if... One thing I want to point out is that's going to shock you if his grappling... Uh, thing, he has never taken the takedown mm -hmm. in it's UFC. Crazy. And again, Ferguson has a takedown accuracy as well, whereas Gichi barely has anything in takedown. Yeah, he's never taken the takedown. If he is taken down, he's extremely efficient on the ground, but he has never taken someone down. Yeah. And he's never, he's barely won by submission either. It's like there's submission average. Yeah, there's hardly any submissions basically, even yeah. though he has the Greco Roman background, that is, which yeah. honestly, like, very surprises me a bit. But you never know. We, he could surprise us in this fight too. Um, go yeah. up, go up again, basically. Okay. So significant strikes. 
landed per minute in uh, Ferguson's 5.51 and Gaethje 8.5. This would more put my money on Gaethje in terms of strike. I'm surprised that his striking is rather better, even though he has a background in, uh, like, what do you call it? Wrestling. Gra- wrestling, wrestling, yes. So, and even then, he has a better percentage in significant fright- fights uh, compared to Ferguson, that is 54%. Um, absorbed, even he can absorb punishment too. Like he can absorb 10.23 compared to Ferguson's 3.55. So he can absorb punishment. However, his defense is also very lacking compared to Ferguson. So Ferguson has a very good defense. Yeah. So Ferguson has an advantage, like if he can use his defense. Um, like your offense is usually as good as, should be as, as good as your defense. That is, that's yeah. kind of how the scene goes. So Ferguson having a slight advantage here in terms of past statistics that is um what are the other statistics that we can look at yeah so this is his grappling and that's what the ufc actually gives yeah. but in my if i want to give my honest opinion of this fight yeah. uh Gaethje, the way he should have trained mm-hmm. he should not pull a ronda rousey the last two fights ronda lost because her bot i want I want to find out who her boxing coach is, and I want to kick his ass. Because, <laughs> yeah, she tried who, to box against. Who the hell takes a judo Olympic medalist mm-hmm. and tries to make her a boxer like uh, nuns? Who yes. the hell, Nunes? Who think, the hell does that? Is I think this, this guy's uh, suffering from CTE. I think the um, what do you call it? This happened with like um, a shoot fight between Bart Gunn and um, what do you call it? Uh, Butterbean Dax. Yeah. Butterbean was a boxer, right? Now yeah. Butterbean stated that um, if Bart Gunn tried to fight the way he fought in the brawl for all, that is, he would have had a fifty-fifty chance of winning. That is, like if he fought naturally, that is, like his natural ability. Bart Gunn, they train him to box, and then he tried to box Butterbean. And Butterbean said, okay, this is going to be easy. And he knocked him out. That is. Yeah. Like, I, whatever I, uh, like, whatever happens, I want Gaethje to stick to his roots and do do what he does best. Do what he does best, yeah. Because Ferguson is a wild animal. This isn't the time to, like, start using some new, like, techniques Mm -hmm. that his coach recommended in the last, like, five minutes before the fight in the locker room. Because that's essentially what happened with Ronda. Yeah, that was what happened with Ronda. Like, she um, was, like, the reason she also transitioned to pro wrestling better was because of her grappling background, not for her striking background. Yet, I see, like, you know, the the striking, like, being part of her, uh, what do you call it, armor, um, uh, her... Uh, I'm losing words, basically. Her arsenal, that is. Even though, basically, grappling is her bigger strength, that is. So I kind of did not get why she, uh, you know, she was trying to, like, box. The thing is, anyone who knows uh, fighting mm-hmm. knows that a submission winner will take down a striking. Yes. Because it takes multiple punches to knock someone out. It's not a one-punch thing, mm-hmm. especially at that level. But it takes one guillotine, one co- uh, trying yeah, to, one choke, yeah, one naked choke to KO one, someone. Yeah, if it's like one opponent, then yeah, grappling is a, bo- a lot more effective. Whereas if it's multiple opponents, then I would say like striking has the advantage that is. Um, yeah, it, but in a UFC, in an octagon. We're talking UFC, yes. In an octagon, having that grappling knowledge, how wrestlers if you look at the UFC wrestlers make the best uh fighters Khabib yeah is a god Brock Lesnar Brock Lesnar yeah you had Dan Severn um you had Ken Shamrock you had uh uh Swagger uh you had oh, crap uh what's that um yeah so some like if you have like NCAA wrestling background that is you have a very big advantage in terms yeah. of in the octagon. And the, the god himself, Hoist Gracie. Hoist Gracie, yes, absolutely. That, like the early uh, match of Hoist Gracie and Kim Shamrock, did, mm-hmm. I'm, I feel like I'm bitching every, uh, this topic every time we have a podcast, but my god, that guillotine, 
the guillotine and triangle yes. that um, Hoy- Hoyce Gracie got on Ken Shamrock that fight, it took almost 15 to 20 minutes for Ken to pull out of it. Yeah, because like, keep in mind, Ken is a, and keep in mind, Ken is not an easy dude to keep down. So he was able to keep him down yeah. for, uh, for that long, that is. And like someone as dangerous as Ken Shamrock, it's like, I would not let go. Once I have that position, like psychologically, I would, should not even let that go. Yeah. So uh, here's another uh, title fight that's going on. Mm-hmm. So Henry, the, the messenger versus Dominator, Dominic and Henry. Okay. Henry has 15 to, oh, so he's lost two fights already. Dominic has a slightly better fight record. Henry is slightly shorter, but he's a defending champion. Okay. Four yeah. inches short. Okay. That might make a difference. Four inches does make a difference. Um, Dominic has a better reach um, in terms of like the fists. So yeah, I would say Dominic has slight advantage over here, but keep in mind, Henry is the defending champion. Win by, ooh. Henry has won by KO more times. Yeah, uh, this guy's a grappler, right, uh, Cruz? So Dominic Cruz is a grappler mainly. Yeah. Uh, decision 54% too. Ooh, Dominic has better, um, what do you call it, uh, average fight time because he can last longer. That is, yeah. he can last long. Whereas Dominic, um, actually Henry has a slightly lower fight average, but even then it's significantly good fight average yeah. because they can last in the octagon. Let's see the grappling. Okay. Takedown average, Dominic Cruz has the advantage. Takedown accuracy, advantage. Takedown defense, however, Henry has a better advantage than that. However, submission average, I'm surprised that Henry has more submissions, that is. So a higher submission average overall. So it's like my money, even though it would be on Dominic Cruz, if it were purely like a submission uh, match. That is. Yeah. Um, however, Henry being the defending champion, you never know. You really never know. Um, so, and he looks in like, they both look in pretty good shape. Like Henry looks in great shape, actually. Yeah. Oh, man, his height will have the grappling advantage when it comes to like, because he's, He's slightly shorter, um, so he'll have the able ability to like go down, basically, you know, like yeah, go down. So Henry doesn't have an advantage, and he has what you call the champion's advantage, basically, you know, like yeah. basically the less, not as much pressure, but Dominic would be, have definitely a lot of pressure on him because um, he's the one after the championship. That is, so yeah, this is definitely an interesting fight that uh, that's going to take place. Um, I'm definitely looking out for the results of this. Yeah, yeah. this is the next uh, fight. So this is uh, my man Ganu versus um, Rosen. Francis versus Rosen. Yeah, Rosenstruck. Rosenstruck, okay. Francis has like more fights, but has lost three times. Six foot four, holy, holy six foot four. These are massive dudes, massive dudes. 250, 242. My God, they are giants. Um, 83 inch reach, very good. Francis, um, Rosen strike, uh, 78 inches, not bad, but like slightly lower than Francis. Um, leg reach as well. Francis has a higher, better leg reach so far. Um, let's go win by. Let's go to the win by statistics. That is, okay, so 71% Francis has by KO or TKO. Uh, Rosen strike has 90%. Wow. So considering uh, he has 10 fights. Yeah, nine out of ten fights, he not won nine of them by knockout. Okay, now that is dangerous. Now that is someone who's like, what do you call it, very strong. That is, that is an indication they're oh, very, very, very really strong. Yeah, so this is a very strong person. Average fight time, even Rosenstruck has a better stamina too. And but, it, but when it's this short, it's not about the. Stamina, it's like one, one and a half rounds, right? Mm. So I'd be wor- I'm worried about the athletic capacity because of how similar they are. Yes. If this lasts more than two rounds, they're screwed because they're not used to fighting past. Not used to, yeah. So now, 
they won't be if they pass the second round yeah both fighters will be significantly you know tired knockdown average uh, Ronson streak has an advantage so go down go down go down significant strikes okay as well as Zurich has an advantage on landed per minute, 46% to 37. Wow. Absorb per minute, too. Like, he can absorb punishment. Um, but defense, Francis is better in terms of defense, that is. Yeah. So, it's difficult to say. So far, my money's on Rosenstrick. But Francis can hold his own, too, based on experience, that is. Experience and defense. Um, grappling... Anyone's these guys are kickboxers. What? I think these guys are kickboxers. Both of these yeah. guys are going to see a kickboxing think, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, but they still have a good takedown, like defense. Defense, yeah. But they're not necessarily take haven't taken down everybody. And go down, go down. Yeah, take down submission. Yeah, Francis has. Yeah, it's still like zero, right? Like, it's still close to zero. So yeah, it's not. These guys are both kickboxers. We're going to see a yeah. kickboxing. More like strikers, boxers, like kind of like in that. Yeah, they're more or, least, more, more or less strikers, both of them. So my money's on Rosenstruck, but you never know. Yeah, so this is a Jeremy Stevens versus a Calvin Catter. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Calvin Catter is definitely the most experienced fighter. But, but in terms of the octagon, holy 28 to 17. Wow, yeah. that's a like Jeremy is also very very experienced. Uh, slight height advantage for Calvin Qatar, but a better reach, uh, leg reach. However, Stephens has a lot of experience. That is, go down, win by percentage. So he's won by KO more Jeremy Stephens compared to Calvin Qatar. Um, submission I'd, ten. Yeah. In these stats, I think they're pretty even. Mm -hmm. Because the number of like you got to consider the number of, number of fights, yes. Yeah. Average fight time. Okay, so these guys can last more than two rounds. Yeah. Um, so they have like, fairly, fairly good, decent stamina. That is. Yeah. Um, with a slight advantage on Jeremy Stephens, that is, uh, in terms of stamina. Knockdown average almost the same, basically. Yeah, this is a significant strikes. Kalan Qatar is better in landed per minute in terms of significant. Jeremy Stephens has is just one percent short of Kalan Qatar. Yeah, so not too much of a big difference. Yes, um, Kalan Qatar can absorb punishment. They're also fairly even in defense too, like just a high slight one percent advantage for Jeremy yeah. Stephens. But these fighters seem almost evenly matched, if anything. Yeah, pretty much. Like, I'd say these guys are both grapplers. They're, like, have an even mix of grappling right. and kickboxing. They're purely, like, mixed martial arts, you know? Yeah. Takedown defense is better on Kamlin Qatar by 12%, but takedown accuracy is Jeremy Stephens, 5% advantage. Um, this one will be difficult to say because even the takedown average is Jeremy Stephens, 1.18, uh, 0.47 for 15 minutes, mind you. Um even though he has a slight advantage, Jeremy Stephens, but again, this is difficult to say. <laughs> My money could be on Jeremy Stephens based on the experience, that is. Um, yeah. In but, this case, it would be too even for me to call. I'd place money on both of them. Yeah, yeah it's very even. So far, it's fairly even, that is. Yeah. And then this is the next matchup. Holy. So, okay. So, these are big dudes. 265, 250 pounds. Okay, six at five, six at one. Wow. And like very fairly big gentlemen. Not a lot of fights. Five to one and five to zero. Oh, that is. Not a lot of fights. Uh, Greg Hardy has a better reach than Castro. Uh, leg reach is also slightly better. Um, and it has a slight four inch advantage too in the fight. Yeah, I'm expecting uh, Castro to use a bit more grappling in this fight yes. because he's fighting a bigger dude. I wouldn't... I wouldn't strike. Yeah, I wouldn't strike the bigger dude. Knowing uh, how am I uh, striking a guy that's like four inches taller than me and has a 15-pound weight in Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would definitely try to, like, take down this guy. 
No, by KO or TKO. Ooh, Greg Hardy has 100% KO. Jordan Castro is like slightly 80%. Even though they're fairly, I'm guessing these are specialists when it comes to knockouts, basically. Yeah. Um, well, they're heavy dudes, right? So There's not average fight time. I'm guessing like they, I'm guessing like Jordan Castro, like how, how often has he finished his fight? In the first round, I'm guessing? Yeah. No, still can. Greg Hardy can go the second round. Okay. How slight advantage when it comes to like uh, stamina. Okay, 388 per minute, significant. Greg Hardy has an advantage. I don't think they have any of the statistics for the yeah, 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 they just uh, seem to not have any statistics for Castro. But we know more about Greg Hardy. Takedown defense is uh, 66%, which is pretty good, actually. So, well, yeah. well, it's completely unknown for Castro. Yeah, so this is another fight I just want to get your quick opinion on. The rest I couldn't give to shits about uh this one's also live mm. but like uh, like i said i no, couldn't no, like the smaller either. fights i couldn't give less of a shit about yeah we, we don't know much about them we'll have to see for ourselves you know yeah so um you got the pettis versus serone fight yeah pettis is a good fighter i he is yeah. a good but the, like donald Cerrone has more experience 36 to 14 a yeah, lot. both is, both these guys got their ass whooped in the fights that we saw. Yeah, and mind you, like these are good fighters too. Like these are fairly good fighters. Yeah. Um, better reach for Donald because he's slightly three inches taller. Yeah. But Pettis has a better like knockout record. That is in terms yeah. of knocking out his opponent. So it means that we go down. So in thirty-two for versus forty, thirty-two. 22 fights he won. 10 of them he won by KO. Whereas the um, 36 fights that Donald Caron won, he only won, let's just say, one-third, which is 12, hardly 12 of those fights with KO. Um, submission, so he's ba- better in terms of submission and decision. But in terms of like a striker, Anthony Pettis has an advantage. And Pettis can take that fight to the third round too. Uh, yeah. Slight advantage in terms of like stamina, whereas Donald Caron usually ends the fight by the second round. Yeah. Better knockdown average by Pettis as well. So Pettis seems like an animal in this situation. Caron seems to be the more experienced grappler, but Pettis seems like an animal, basically a young, hungry animal. Um, landed per minute, okay, Caron has a better land, but they significant strikes are almost the same. Like percentage. Yeah, Considering how low it is, I'm not expecting them to be a... Uh... Full on, uh, right, like yeah. it's not going to be like the fight that we watched before with uh, Sadiq and Davis. Yeah, like they've been full striking. These guys yes. are a bit more calculated and a bit more slow. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, even defense is almost similar. Basically, yeah. fifty-three percent, fifty-four percent grappling. Okay, takedown. Even that's not okay. One point to do. Corona has a slight advantage in takedown, but accuracy is for Pettis. Uh, take down defense. Caron is better. So Caron seems to have what I feel like is the, the experience advantage that is. Like he seems yeah. to be, well, based on like experience, he has definitely an advantage. But Pettis seems to be more unpredictable, young and hungry that is. So, and more with more energy that is. So that seems to be the advantage. Hold on a second. Yeah. No worries. But yeah, so I'm actually uh, excited for the Pettis fight. But my main fight that I'm super interested in is the Gaethje versus uh, Ferguson because it's so goddamn even that I don't know quite what to expect as per output. My heart says to go with Ferguson. But as long as Justin Gaethje doesn't pull a Ronda Rousey, uh, we're pretty safe. Yeah. yeah, so I was just recapping what we said. I don't, like, for the main title fight, uh-huh. as long as Justin Gaethje doesn't pull a uh, Ronda Rousey. <laughs> then he definitely has an advantage. Yeah, uh-huh. he'll definitely uh, do well, and it'll go till decisions. Yeah. But the moment he starts, the moment he has some stupid coach telling him to, like, start doing some next 
that he learned in the locker room five minutes yeah. before the fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's yeah. gonna go in there and he's gonna get beaten like an Asian parent beats his child. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, so uh, that concludes our uh, episode for this week, guys. Um, thank you guys for coming on. Thank, thank you so much for uh, over. So I have to attend to like you know family matters. Uh, like, the, all right. Thank you guys so much for uh, watching. And uh, yeah, I wish I had a bit more privacy, but uh, currently I don't. All right. See ya. See ya.